song says we're in joyful song we even as we come with with joyful hearts we recognize that we also there's things in life that give us heavy hearts but we know that no matter what we go through and when we're going through it we can have the joy in the spirit of knowing that our eternity is secure of knowing that you are our God that you are our caregiver and that through no matter what we go through we can give you all the praise and we can give you all the glory. Thank you for this group of people that is gathered here in this place today. We pray that you will do another mighty work in our midst, that you'll speak to us in your word, uh, that you'll hear our prayers and communicate back with us, answer back with us, that you'll receive the songs that we sing uh, as an as a, as a offering, as a fragrance that rises up to you, Lord, and it may bless your heart. Help us to, as we study here today, as we worship here today, to think about what it means to live a life that is pleasing to you. May we be pleasing to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated for a moment. A couple things I'll bring your attention to. Uh, two things. It's already in your bulletin. There's no impact uh, meeting tonight for, for our youth. Also, something that is listed in your bulletin, but we're not going to do, it's not going to be a Women on Mission uh, facilitation meeting uh, tonight either. So please uh, take those things into account. There is going to be 39 Above Club uh, this Tuesday, so if you can come out for breakfast. And of course, uh, other things are in your bulletin, but one thing uh, that is really important is the Cary Eford Memorial Scholarship bike run. So I'm pretty sure you're supposed to say something, right? Yeah. yeah go ahead and give us some info. This Saturday is our 25th annual Kerry D. for Moral Scholarship Bike Run. It's hard to believe it's been 25 years, but thanks for all your help, your prayers. Um, just a little bit about Kerry for y'all, but some of you and you folks that don't know Kerry. Kerry was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at 11 months old. She did pretty good, you know, most of her life. Um, and then with continuous infections and stuff, Kerry was put on a double lung transplant. And uh, 
and she received those loans Mother's Day, May 10th of 1997. Um, she did pretty good for the first, you know, year or so, but then after rejection and everything, uh, she succumbed to that. And um, we, uh, Carrie agreed to do a, a walkathon. Um, cystic fibrosis has a walkathon called Great Strides, and Carrie uh, agreed to be the chairperson. So uh, we received the funeral. The, at the day of her funeral, we received that packet. So um, you know, we decided to do a motorcycle run. You know, a lot of her friends and stuff that ride motorcycles. So the first year, we, we raised, I think, $3,500. We give half of it to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And the other, we started a scholarship. Some teachers and, and Donna and guidance counselors at West Ellen wanted to start a scholarship in Carrie's name. So here we are, you know, 25 years later, and it's hard to believe that it's been that long. but. Um, Carrie loved the Lord, and um, if you've seen one of our bike friend shirts, it's got frogs on it. Carrie loved frogs. Her, her theme was fully rely on God. Um, this year's shirt, you're not going to believe it because there's a frog on there for every year. So there's 25 frogs on this shirt this year. Tracy does a great job in doing that. But it's always a Bible verse because we believe that our faith, you know, that we'll see Carrie again. Mm. And thank you so much for all that you do, all your thoughts and your prayers. We leave at 10 o'clock. The food will be there, so come on out. If you don't ride a motorcycle, come on out and enjoy some food and fellowship and raffle. We'll get back probably 1, 1.30. But, again, thank you so much for all that you do to support, support that. And uh, so far, we've given $117,000 to seniors at West Allen. This being the uh, 20, 25th year, we're going to try to take it to $125,000. Uh, so thanks again for your help and your support. Sounds like we got a wonderful way to, you know, setting that extra goal, you know, that 125,000. So I encourage you to to think generously, and of course we support uh, we support Scotty and Tracy, and uh, many of you got to got to know Carrie, and I didn't get to know her on this side of heaven, but uh, I always reflect on the fact that I will, and uh, and then we'll probably have some kind of conversation about how we both have the same name. I always think of it think of it that way. You know, I'll ask her why she has a boy's name. That's what I'm going to ask her. But uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a wonderful ride and uh, it's a wonderful experience. And so I can say that. And I don't own a motorcycle, but I've been every year. So you can too. And those of you who have been, uh, you know that. One other thing I want to mention uh, out in the foyer are, is are these lists. These are lists for the uh, Baptist Children's Home. Uh, food drive and what what strikes me is that we still have a pile of you didn't bring them in today did you they're in the car all right wow we got our our food that we're donating finally made it out of our kitchen and it was sitting out for like a week and a half and so it's in the car now so now we just need to get it uh in the bin that's there in the in the vestibule in the foyer so i know a lot of times you're just like me you're thinking i need to get that done need to get that done april is the food drive for a food roundup for baptist children's home and you know how much food costs these days and so anything that you can give there's also ways you can give uh you can give gift cards to that as well so uh, you know, talk to me. Uh, you can look, go, go look up Baptist Children's Home Food Roundup online. You can find out more. But you can, if you don't say, I don't really have time or I don't want to just give them leftover food that nobody wants to eat. You know, I don't want to give them just tomato paste, you know, cans of that. I want to give them some, you know, something they'll want to eat. Uh, you can do, you can do uh, uh, gift cards, you know, for food. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, one thing I want before we sing our next song, be hymn number 181, not, No, Not One. It'll also be on the screen, of course. I want to also remind you uh, that we have these tear-off flaps that are in your bulletin, and this is a way uh, for you to respond. You can do it. You can physically turn these into me when you leave. You can put them in an offering plate when you leave. You can also submit these electronically. And by the way, some people, right after church, uh, when my head's spinning around, I'm talking to people, you'll, tell, you'll mention a prayer request to me. And if you've gotten to know me a little bit yet, there is uh, about a 50-50 chance that I'm going to remember to put that uh, in, the, in the bulletin. But if you will send that in electronically, it's really easy. You scan this right here. It sends it to my email. And then I have that reminder right there. And so we make sure we get that prayer request in. And also, if you have a prayer request, it's just a personal one. You can submit those uh, as well. So please keep that in mind. With that, let's stand. Let's sing hymn number 181. No, not one.
choir is getting settled, I would like to ask you to open to Colossians chapter 1. Today we begin a three-part series entitled, Who Will You? And in that, we're going to ask three questions. Today, first question is, who will you please? And as we had today's message, and then for the next two weeks, there are more of what you call topical messages in the sense that we have a topic, and then we'll pull from various areas of God's word uh, in speaking to that topic. So a little different than strict expository message in which you pick a section of scripture and cover that verse by verse. We kind of jump around a lot. Of course, I will give you, you have the, in the bulletin, you have a card so that you don't have to do those uh, scripture calisthenics, I call them, where you jump around in your Bible trying to keep up. You can follow along there. You can, but if you want to do calisthenics, that's fine too. You can do that as well. I also, we'll put them up on the screen. So this isn't strictly our, our text for today, but this is going to be, the majority of it anyways, the text that we close on at the end of the message. And as you know then, that the title of the message here in a moment, after we sing, and don't get too comfortable, we're about to sing our preparatory hymn. But after we do that, you'll know we're going to be talking about uh, living, who we live to please, and I got a shocker for you here. The message is going to encourage us, or God's word is going to encourage us to live to please who? Who do you guess we should live to please? Live to please God, right? And so that's how we start off. If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, go in four words there. The word walk. It says, walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God remains forever. Amen? Amen. Please stand, let's sing our preparatory hymn before our message. The King, no, it's a, it's a medley. I love you, Lord, and we fall down.
Like we already mentioned, the sermon series is Who Will You? And then a, a question goes on each time. This week we ask the question Who will you live to please? Part two will ask the question Who will you choose to serve? And then in part three, we'll ask the question, who will you decide to follow? I'm excited about those messages as well, but I got to tell you, this message was especially fun. As we look at different sections of God's word that, that talk about, get us to think about who are we trying to please with how we live our lives. To kind of get there, and I'll give away the ending, okay? The ending is that we're supposed to live our lives to please God. That's where we get to. But how do you get there? We have to start at who we are naturally. Who we are in the flesh. Who we are when we're born into this world. And in terms of who we live to please, there's two things in regards to our natural selves. The, By the way, you'll see many... Verses from the New International Version here. We have some from the English Standard Version, some from the New King James. Uh, sometimes that's a fun thing to do when you bounce around like that is find uh, the translation that best captures uh, exactly you know, what God is communicating uh, in that section of the message. Uh, believe me, though, I never, I never allow it to take it out of context. You know, always make sure that it's taken in correct context, but sometimes... You know, how, how something is worded may speak to us a little more uh, powerfully or intimately. And so, with that in mind, it used to be, and you'll, you'll see this in older copies of the New International Version, uh, some of you will recognize this, where the word flesh was, was changed to sinful nature. Does that sound familiar? Where in flesh it was his sinful nature. And I, I will admit that as a young Christian... That made a lot more sense to me than the flesh. What, what is the flesh? You know, oh, well that, that's, that's, a, that's our natural selves. That we're born, that naturally we're born in sin and we have a sinful nature. Now, the, the New International Version, since I believe about the last 10 years or so, has gone, then kind of gone back and now it, it just translated it the flesh. Uh, in the Greek, it's the word sarx. And that is the literal translation. It is the flesh. What the flesh is, born in the flesh, is our natural selves. Being a Christian is unnatural. If you ever thought about it that way. It's unnatural to be a Christian. We're not born a Christian. We're not born with the Holy Spirit. We are not born in faith. We are born separated from God by sin. And that is the natural self. That is in the flesh. So two things we want to look at, what we are naturally in regards to who we live to please. Number one is this. Naturally, we have preset minds. We have preset minds. Seems like every what? About how many years you need to buy a new computer? Five? Maybe five? Five? Who's got like a 15-year-old computer still works? A couple of you, right? Danny's limping that sucker along, right? Uh, you know, and, and many of us would lament. They make things to break down now, but really what, what it is is that technology just moves so quick. And so it seems like every few years we have to buy a new computer. And when you get that computer, it'll come with some pre-set things on the computer. And sometimes we even look and there's not enough preset on this computer, so we'll, we'll buy some software and we'll install it on the computer. But that gives us an idea of what we're talking about. We have preset minds out the box, so to speak, that we are then preset in a certain way of thinking. Now, certainly that, that way of thinking is then molded and shaped as we grow up in a culture we grow up in and our influences but in terms of everybody born naturally, and the preset mind concept, the preset way of thinking, 
The scripture says this, Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. That's really important to understand. The natural mind, the, the natural mind is set on the flesh because it, that is what we naturally are. And we cannot submit to God's law. We don't have that ability. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, that's really important. Now, we know that this all goes around to big surprise. You're at church on a Sunday morning, and we're asking the question, who, do you, who will you live to please? And in the heart of that is already, who do you live to please? We all have to be confronted with that right now. What we realize is that in the flesh, in our natural selves, we cannot live to please God. We can't because we don't, have, we don't have it installed yet, if you go along with the computer illustration there. It's not installed in our proverbial hard drive. We don't have it in us. We can't conceive of it. Here it's described as we cannot even submit to God's law. We can't understand God's law. We can't comprehend God's law. We can't then furthermore apply God's law. We are in the flesh. We have preset minds. And because of this, this leads to number two. Because we naturally have preset minds, we also then have preset methods. Preset ways of going about things and doing things. Preset ways of acting in the flesh according to the natural person, the natural self. Preset ways of doing things. Preset ways of going about things. Preset ways of acting. Preset ways of functioning. And in regards to that, we have Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Whoever sows to please their flesh... Okay, you notice that. There we go. We're talking about pleasing the flesh. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now we are presented with two options, two separate ways of living. One is to please the flesh. To please the natural person. We're talking about the, who we are naturally. Once again, you'll notice this is a New International Version translation. If you looked in an older copy of that, you would see where it would say, whoever sows to please the sinful nature. That was the way I originally learned that verse. Whoever sows to please their sinful nature, their natural selves. Well, it tells you that what that's going to reap in the long run, sowing has to do with planting seed. And when you plant seed, you hope to get something in return. Something's supposed to grow. Something's supposed to be produced. It says whoever sows, whoever lives their life uh, to please their flesh, to please that sinful nature, that natural person we are, well, they're going to reap destruction. Because we are born in sin, we sow sin, we will reap sin, and ultimately what you reap from sin is death. It is destruction. But now we are presented with this option that we can sow to please the Spirit. From the Spirit we'll reap eternal life. Now when we're talking about the Spirit here, uh, you'll notice it's capitalized. It's not talking about your soul. All right? It's not really talking about your spiritual self. It's talking about the third person of the Godhead. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make up the Godhead, the Trinity. And so it talks in here about then if it says, if you're sowing to please the Spirit... The Spirit is fully God, then this is sowing to please God. And it says the result of that will reap eternal life. The opposite then of eternal destruction is eternal life. We will naturally please the flesh. We will naturally live our lives to please that sinful nature. That's who we are naturally. That's the way our minds are created. In sin, the way we're born, I guess, would be a better way to, to explain it. We're born in sin. We're born in the flesh. Therefore, we think according to the flesh. We think according to the sinful nature. And what we then 
sow and reap. Our sow has to do with the methods, and what we end up getting is the results of a naturally lived life, which it says here is contrary to God, cannot please God, reaps destruction. But faith changes everything. And I'm not talking about faith in terms of anything you want to believe. When we say faith, in fact, on your card you'll notice it says, but our faith changes things. When we talk about our faith, who's our faith in? Our faith is in the one true God through Jesus Christ, his one and only son. So when we say our faith changes anything, it's not the our power of our belief. It's the power of who our belief is in. Our faith in Jesus Christ changes things because it changes who we are naturally. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's saying a lot, isn't it? Without faith, and it's not talking about any faith, It's talking about our faith. It's talking about faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in some false God, faith in oneself, faith in one's friends, faith in one's country, whatever other faith we're talking about, uh, you still remains impossible to please God. But the faith named here is faith in Jesus Christ. And it tells us, without faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to please God. That means you and I cannot do it under our natural power. The natural person, the natural man, the natural woman cannot please God. It's impossible, it says. I understand impossible. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? It it goes on. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In this... It tells us what it's talking about when it says faith. We must first of all believe that God exists and believe that if we will come to him, if we will earnestly seek him, we will find his son, Jesus Christ. And the reason why I especially like the New International Translation here is because it uses the word earnestly. Some of your translations will say those who seek him. What what, What does that really mean, seek him? Because we're all about doing things halfway or partially, aren't we? That's in our human nature. So what, one, what does it mean to really seek God? The Bible tells him that if you seek God, you will find him. But there's a caveat there. If you seek him with all your heart. So I like the fact that the NIV specifies there and it says, if you earnestly seek him, if you're really seeking him, you will find him in Jesus Christ. And then you will understand, having believed that he exists, you sought him, you find him, and that ultimately that I have eternal life, that's my eternal reward, an eternal inheritance because of what Jesus did on that cross and then did afterwards in conquering death. He died for my sins, he rose from the grave. This is our faith. And what faith does is faith makes the impossible possible. That's a good saying, isn't it? Faith makes the impossible possible. One of my favorite verses, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, uh, talks about that. How with God, you know, and we know have other scriptures that talk about how with God, you know, all things are possible with God. I can do all things. Is that where the verse ends? It doesn't end with I can do all things because I and my natural self cannot do all things. Apparently, I can't. Please God in my natural self. Scripture goes on from Philippians, right? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, by faith in Jesus Christ, makes what is impossible possible. And the context of this verse here is pleasing God. The very idea of pleasing God with the lives that we live. What is it that faith does that makes the impossible possible in this sense. Well, we said there's two things about our natural selves that make it impossible, that we have these preset minds, and because we have these preset minds in the natural person, we have these preset methods, and we end up reaping what we sow. 
We end up reaping destruction until of eternal life, but then we come to faith, and we know we have eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But what is a mechanism that happens that then makes the impossible possible and makes it so that we can live to please God? Well, two things for this as well. First of all, we say we have preset minds in our natural selves. Well, what happens is our faith changes our perspective. That's number one. It changes our perspective. How you see things. I know I've used this illustration before, but I, see, I live on a cul-de-sac. I like cul-de-sacs, not a lot of traffic. Somebody pulls down there, it's a strange car, you're looking out going, why are they pulling down here? What are they doing in my cul-de-sac? You know? I, I got my cul-de-sac, and I see my cul-de-sac from our house all the time. I see it from that all the time. Every now and then, though, there's some reason that I need to go over to one of my neighbor's house in the cul-de-sac. Maybe I need to borrow something. Maybe I need to ask a question. Maybe the kids are trying to raise money for some sports team. Uh, maybe their mail got delivered to my house. But I'll go over and say I give them the mail, and I turn around and I look at my house from a totally different perspective. And it's weird. Because I always see things from this one perspective. I hardly ever really see things the way they look from their house. Of course, the first thing I always do is analyze how good my grass looks. But I'm still, I'm seeing there from, from, from a different perspective. What faith does is it changes our perspective. It changes our way of looking at things from the natural person to now an unnatural person. A person who is changed by faith. In regards to this, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, and then verse 9. For we live by faith, not by sight. What are we talking about here? We're talking about perspective, by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. And because we live by faith, not by sight, and sight then is a reference to how you see things naturally. Now, faith has changed my perspective. I see things differently because of my faith. And so... Goes to verse 9. So, because of this, and that's what the word so here in verse 9 is connecting back to then what was in verse 7. Because of this, because I live by faith, not by sight, I make it my goal to please him. Who is him here? Him is God. NIV has a tendency not to capitalize all the, the hymns and the he's in there, so sometimes, sometimes that frustrates folks, but it's referring to God here. And when it says, so because I live by faith, not by sight, I, we, make it our goal to please him. But you notice there, I just said a minute ago that it's impossible to please God without faith, but you know all that's come in here is that perspective has changed, and now who I live to please my who I live my life to please changes. And now I make it my goal to please him, to please God instead. And it goes on. So now some of you will recognize this verse even more now. Whether we are at home in the body or whether we are away from it. So it's talking about even in this life I live in the flesh, I must I want to live to please him because my perspective has changed. Our faith changes things. First of all, it changes our perspective in regards to that preset mind, but also in regards to preset methods, it changes, number two, our process. Changes our process. Well, we say before, we have preset methods. Pleasing the flesh. But then it gave us another choice. It said living to please the spirit. Remember this earlier from Galatians 6? Living to please the flesh, the natural self, or living to please the spirit. How does the Spirit come into the equation? The Spirit comes when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and He comes in, and we are born again by the Spirit. And no longer is the Spirit just out here, but the Spirit now is in here. We have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit by faith. And so out of faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the Spirit. And now not only does our perspective change, that has to change first before your process will change. First, I'm sorry, yeah, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, notice that, this is very important because he's saying brothers and sisters. It's addressing other Christians, not addressing the natural man, not addressing the natural person, but the unnatural person, the person born again, the person in the spirit, 
the person of faith. Brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Instruction given in order to please God. As in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Being instructed in a newly ordered way of living. Twice it says, well, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Where did this instruction come from? We see that at the end of the verse, end of verse 2, we gave this to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. This instruction came from Jesus Christ as he passed it on to his apostles. And in these same apostles were the ones that then give us our New Testament. So it's communicated from Jesus to the apostles who give us the word of God and then by the word of God, the faithful are instructed in the process of then living a life, living in order to please God. Our perspective changes with faith, but our process is something that, though it derives from that perspective change, it's a pro- it's, the process is changed as we learn, as we are instructed by God's word, how to then live a life that is pleasing to God. Hopefully, if you've been a Christian for a while, you have been in God's word and you have been instructed in times like this, at times just you and God in in his word. Other times you were listening to other preaching and teaching and Bible study and Sunday school and all these things, and you have learned. But also, you've learned through applying God's word to your daily life and started to learn how to live this life that pleases God. When it comes down to it, we really have three choices. You could probably fill in number three ahead of time if you want. See if you're right. I think you'll probably get it. But we're going to start with number one because that's what you do before you get to two and three. Number one is this. First option, we can live to please ourselves. That's number one. We have a choice. Once you have the spirit, if you have faith, you have a choice. You can live to please yourself or you can live to please God. You didn't really have a choice before. It was impossible for you to please God in your natural self. But if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you have a choice. You can live to please God or you can live to please yourself. In terms of living to please yourselves, what we naturally do. By the way, you don't need faith for this. You will do this naturally. It is the natural person. I want to look at Jesus' example. Two things in regards to Jesus' example. First of all, is something he said about himself. He said, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus is showing you this choice. He's saying, of himself, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, did he? He didn't want to endure great pain. Who wants to do that? But he wasn't living to please his flesh. He was living to please his father who sent him. It is on this basis that Paul in the book of Romans writes, For even Christ, who has every right because he is God to live to please himself, did not please himself. Jesus is our example. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you understand that living to please myself is not the life I'm called to live. Paul's illustration was one of a soldier, 2 Timothy chapter 2. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself, and let me be very clear with you, we are in a spiritual battle every single day. We live in a world of good, but we also live in a world of evil. And there's the constant battle between good and evil and the tension to it every day. And it's not only fighting out here, it's fighting for our very attention. It's fighting for how we will live our lives and who we will live to please. And it says, nobody engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of of this life. What does that mean? That he may instead please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Do you remember the song, Onward, Christian Soldiers? It's a battle anthem. Onward, Christian Soldiers, reminding us that we are 
soldiers enlisted in the army of God. That we don't serve the forces of evil in this world anymore. But we serve God himself. We are his soldiers. We serve in his army. And as a soldier, it means that we live to please him. As opposed to getting entangled in the affairs instead of this life. The reality is, is a lot of us, we find ourselves entangled, don't we? And when we get entangled, we get entangled in the affairs of this life. That's, that, that's all the details of our lives. And we get so entangled, we find ourselves, well, wait a minute. I'm not living to please God. I, I'm, I'm living to please myself. You may find yourself today entangled. Start to cut the ropes. Get untangled. Well, there is another choice, by the way. Some of you will know this one very well, but all of us know it. We can live to please ourselves, number one, or number two, we can live to please other people. A couple of you made faces just then, by the way, when I said that. A couple of you made this mm, face like that. A lot of you did, actually, by the way. I want you to know that. And some of you didn't make the face, but you were thinking it, weren't you? Like, mm-hmm. Living to please other people. We could have just said living to please others. But let's, let's talk about, let's put the word people in there. People what? People pleasing, right? Living our lives in such a way to please other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Is it bad to please, is it bad to please other people? Well, I'll give you some scripture right here that talks about pleasing other people. Paul writes, I try to please everyone in everything I do. Not seeking my own advantage, but that, that of many, that they may be saved. Well, then it would seem that that is then the way to live life, right? It would be to please everyone in everything that I do. What's the recognition here? And we got some other scripture to compare it to. And the scripture doesn't contradict itself. The scripture will always complement itself. We shouldn't live our lives to please ourselves. There should be an extent to which our lives we do seek to please other people, but not for the sake of pleasing them, but for their greater benefit, right? You see the result that he's looking for. I do this that they may be saved that they may be saved for the communication of the gospel, for their betterment. But there's a difference between doing something for somebody's betterment and doing something for somebody's approval, isn't there? You follow me? There's a difference between doing something for someone's betterment and doing something for someone's approval. A lot of times people won't know it's for their betterment. So what do we say in that regard? Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. We want to live our lives to better other people, to help other people. But it cannot be... Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Because when it comes down to it, and I'll give it to you in another sense. If there is a law, we're supposed to follow it. It's the law of the nation you live. You're supposed to follow it, right? But what if that law violates God's law? God's law beats man's law every single time. When it comes to this, if winning the approval of other people is more important to me than winning the approval of God. If pleasing other people is more important than pleasing God, then I've got my priorities turned upside down. So while it is, yes, I would try to please everyone for their betterment, I will not try to please everyone for their approval. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings, he asks, or of God? Sometimes it'll be one or the other, and it'll just always be God. Or am I just trying, and this is the reason I gave you this translation, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant 
of Christ. Then lastly in this section, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Our purpose is to please God, not people. Seems kind of contradictory to 1 Corinthians everyone when he says, I try to please everyone. But that's why we've sort of been bouncing these and comparing them off each other. Ultimately, it must be this. I, I love to make people happy. I want to better people. We must think that way. I don't want to be self-serving. But at the same time, my purpose, your purpose needs to be to please God, not people. And for those in the room that really struggle with people pleasing, this needs to be probably the most growth level area. Others of us will struggle with more pleasing, more living to please ourselves. And many of us will relate to both. But our purpose needs to be to please God, no more, not people, because He alone examines the motives of our heart. He alone knows why we do what we do. So the last choice is this, number three. We can live to, number one, please ourselves. We can live to please others. But number three, we can live to please God. You know where this is going. It's not, it's not a trick. It's not a trick question. Who will you live to please? Who will I live to please? To live to please God. I think the scripture reference here is wrong, by the way, at the end. But let, go with this. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Just stop for a moment right there. I know this is a long scripture reading, but that underlined part right there, that's a memory verse, church. That's a memory verse. You and I can remember that. And we have to be, maybe because sometimes in our life, we have to hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against him. We can live, memorize this. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. How do I do this? Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. These are directions for how to then live a life. Bearing good fruit through good work, growing in the faith, growing in knowledge of God, being strong in the Lord in difficult times, times that call on us, it says here, to endure and be patient, giving all gratitude and joy and knowledge of eternity and knowledge of this eternal inheritance. These are the ways to do what's very simply said at the beginning there, to live a life worthy of the Lord. And please him in every way. As we close our service, we ask the question, who are you living to please? Are you primarily living to please yourself? Are you primarily living to please other people? Or are you primarily living to please God? And the extent to which you're living to please God is that in every way. Because there's probably some, ex everybody in here can probably improve upon this. But we must always go back and realize this. Without faith. It is impossible to please God. If you've yet to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that is what needs to happen. That's what's going to change your perspective. That's what's going to change your process. That's what's going to make the impossible possible. You must come to him in faith. You must receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. And of course, you can do that today. You can also indicate on that tear off response form that you'd like to talk about that further. Or maybe there's just something that happened, needs to happen between you and God as we sing our closing hymn. Where you are focused, talking to him now about God, how can I live my life to a greater extent to please you, and not myself and not other people, but you first and foremost. I would ask that that would be your thought. I'll be down here to receive you. Let's please stand. Let's sing our closing hymn. Two, aptly picked, living for Jesus. Mm -hmm. 